Okay. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm obviously here this morning, and Graham will take over at 11 o'clock. Um, but I think those of you who are regulars know it's been suggested that we start streaming before 11, just to give people time to be tuned in by 11. And Graham finds it hard just to do chit chat. I don't mind doing chit chat, but it's funny doing chit chat to a phone and not to a person. But we've also been told the important thing is to look at the camera. Pardon? Already good. Some Graham's just confirmed that someone's already there. Um, so, what has been happening this week? Well, you all know about um, the sort of events that have been in the news, but what have we been doing? Well, we were able to escape Melbourne for t three nights and t two and a bit days because we have permission to thank you, Graham, for turning off the heating because that gives too much background noise. We were in Port Ferry, staying in the house of our son and his wife. We don't feel quite ready to stay in someone else's property, but it was beautiful. We had beautiful weather, and it the air is... We live in a beautiful part of Melbourne, but I have to say the air at the beach or near the beach just smells totally different and we saw some beautiful surf and watched some brilliant surfers but surprise surprise we did not venture into the water much though we both love swimming in the sea and I think now it is time for me to hand over to Graham to begin the service so welcome and thank you for watching. Thank you, Christine, and welcome, a warm welcome to Blackburn Presbyterian Church, and thank you for joining us this morning. Since the 22nd of March, we've been streaming uh, some elements of our usual Sunday service, and this is our 12th streamed service. When we started, we had no idea we'd be becoming so familiar with this routine. I'm grateful to the numerous people who have participated in helping us with this process you can find uh, the church leaflet on the internet at blackburnpc.org.au and it contains a summary of the sermon and some information about the church and the congregation and some of the things that we pray for and the people we pray for regularly. So uh, feel free to download that from the website. Also, since you're watching uh, on Facebook, I uh, invite you to use the, the comments option to record any thoughts or questions or reflections that you might have. They're very welcome. And we try and uh, respond to each of them uh, as we can through the week. Please uh, let us know you visited. Again this week, Amanda will be playing the viola for us. Uh, she's not able to be here th this week. Um, she's traveled across to uh, Adelaide to see her mother and uh, we're trusting that uh, her mother is making a good recovery from an accident that she had, and we pray that this will be uh, a good time for mother and daughter. Uh, Amanda, to you and your mum, God bless you. Today, let us join together in the worship of God and enjoy the wonder of music, and as we pray and listen to the Holy Scriptures and reflect on them together and seek to pursue God's will every day in our lives, according to the teaching of the Lord Jesus. So let us begin with a musical reflection from Amanda. She's playing uh, for us once again uh, from Bach, Sarabanda.
Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gathering of your people. We never imagined that we would gather in this way online, but we thank you for the connectedness that there is, thanks to the amazing technology that's at our fingertips today. We ask that today, as Christian services are shared across the internet, that men and women and boys and girls will hear again the words of Jesus, the words which uh, the apostles uh, recorded so long ago, uh, being guided into the truth by your Spirit, that generations yet unborn might hear the message and come to love and adore your Son and our Saviour, the Lord Jesus. So, Heavenly Father, be with us in this uh, short time together. Speak to us from your word and enrich each of us that we might live as your children today and every day. Amen. Christine is going to bring us young at heart. Thank you, Christine. Um, on May 29th, so just a couple of weeks ago, Tim Tebow was one of the many excellent speakers at the funeral of Ravi Zacharias. Now, for the older amongst the young at heart, if you haven't encountered this man, read any of his works or listened to his talks, I would recommend that you do. He was born in India, studied in Canada, and is now, I think, a U.S. citizen, although he was. He was an incredibly effective, um, intelligent Christian apologist and evangelist. But today I'm talking about Tim Tebow because I think he probably has more appeal to some of the younger, at, the young at heart. He was born in the Philippines to American missionaries. He's mainly famous for his career in American football and baseball. He's also a passionate Christian and a very articulate speaker. After the funeral, which we watched, um, being encouraged to do so by two dear friends in our congregation here, I decided I wanted to know, about, know more about Tim Tebow. I remembered that Graham had told me when he was, I think, still chaplain at um, Scotch, about Tebow's use of eye makeup to share biblical texts during games. Now, I hope, yes, in 2009, as you can see on the screen, Tim Tebow wore eye black, so eye makeup, black eye makeup, with the inscription John 3.16. He has said that 94 million people googled John 3.16 during the game and it was a pretty cool moment. Then, again, he wore, on another time, he wore Ephesians 2, 8 to 10, I think, for it is by grace you have been saved and on it goes one of my very favourite verses, verse 10 of Ephesians 2. Excuse me, sucking a throat lozenge. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Now, I should just add that you are no longer allowed to wear messages in eye makeup on your face during sports games, I gather. Probably, I think, the authorities thought all kinds of undesirable messages might be shared and so they decided to make a blanket ruling, not really related to Tebow. Anyway, back to my research about this young man. What impressed me even more than his sports achievement, his very, very good public speaking, was his philanthropic work. And I thought that links in well with last week's sermon where we remembered that we must be doers of the word of God and not just hearers. As an undergraduate, Thibault 
with other University of Florida students, created FIRST and 15, a group which raised funds for an orphanage in the Philippines where he had been born and his parents worked, and also for a pediatric cancer center in Georgia, as well as giving disadvantaged children a trip to Disneyland. So this group of undergraduate students were very creative in their philanthropic work and very ambitious too. After Tim graduated from the University of Florida, he launched the Team Tim Tebow Foundation in January 2010. I'm just going to tell you about one thing this foundation has done. In 24, 2014, an organization called CURE, C-U-R-E, and the Tebow Foundation together opened an orthopedic children's hospital in Davao City on the island of Mindanao in the Philippines. CURE has seven similar hospitals, so pediatric orthopedic hospitals in other countries, in seven other countries, six in Africa and one in the United Arab Emirates. During, interestingly enough, we're all affected by this global pandemic. And so this hospital took in some orthopedic patients to free up other hospitals dealing with COVID-19 patients, but also accommodated staff from other hospitals who had trouble getting to work because of the lockdown. So let's be grateful for Thibault, who's been given such gifts of athleticism and public speaking, and who, out of gratitude to his parents and to his Lord, feels compelled to improve the lives of those less fortunate. Thibault believes freely you have received, freely give. Now Suzanne is going to read today's passage and I want you to listen for that verse as she is reading. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, the reading today is from the book of Matthew, chapter 10, verses 1 to 20. Jesus called his 12 disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out impure spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. These are the names of the 12 apostles. First, Simon, who is called Peter, and his brother Andrew. James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. Philip and Bartholomew. Thomas and Matthew the tax collector, James son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon the zealot and Judas Iscariot who betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Do not go among the Gentiles or enter any town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. As you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Do not get any gold or silver or copper to take with you in your belts. No bag for the journey or extra shirt or sandals or a staff, for the worker is worth his keep. Whatever town or village you enter, search there for some worthy person and stay at their house until you leave. As you enter the home, give it your greeting. If the home is deserving, let your peace rest on it. If it is not, let your peace return to you. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, leave that home or town and shake the dust off your feet. Truly, I tell you, it will be more bearable for Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. I am sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes 
and as innocent as doves. Be on your guard. You will be handed over to the local councils and be flogged in the synagogues. On my account, you will be brought before governors and kings as witnesses to them and to the Gentiles. But when they arrest you, do not worry about what to say or how to say it. At that time, you will be given what to say, for it will not be you speaking, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Suzanne. Thank you for coming in this morning to, to read with us. It's lovely to have you here. Well, I said last week as we came to a close of, of the Sermon on the Mount, which uh, we spent quite a long time uh, studying, section by section, that we come to one of the root markers in Matthew's Gospel. Um, a root marker, of course, uh, in the old days, there used to be milestones across Victoria, and uh, you could tell uh, how far it was the next town when you saw the milestone. Eventually, of course, they were replaced with the kilometer signs every five kilometers, but they go back a long way. Uh, could this be a Roman root marker? Uh, the inscription on the image uh, on the internet was that it is a Roman root marker, and it, it would tell you uh, how far to the nearest towns. So <clears throat> root markers existed in the ancient world. And what Matthew has done is put what I called root markers into his gospel. You might not have noticed them. I drew attention to them last week when we came to these words at the very end of the Sermon on the Mount when Jesus had finished these words. It tells us what he went on to do. And you might not notice those words in particular because you're thinking, what comes next? Because in, Mark, in Mark's gospel, Mark's very interested in what comes next. He always says immediately Jesus did this and then immediately he did something else. But Matthew includes much more teaching of Jesus and he brackets it in this way. So that a little further on at chapter 11 verse 1 it says, When Jesus had finished teaching his disciples. And as we read on through the gospel in chapter 13 verse 53, at the end of a long chapter on parables, we read when Jesus had finished these parables. And then in chapter 19, verse 1, when Jesus had finished these words once again. And then in chapter 26, when Jesus had finished all these words. So here are the root markers in Matthew's gospel. And he's identifying the blocks of teaching. Why? Well, because he's giving us five words paralleling Moses' giving of the law on Mount Sinai. And the key ideas, which we've already discovered in the Sermon on the Mount, are fulfillment. The law is not to be disposed of. I did not come to abolish the law, he said, but to fulfill it. And so the idea of fulfilling what the law and the prophets had said in ancient Israel uh, is what Jesus is about. And his authoritative words, you have heard that it was said, but I say to you, is the alternative that we get through the Sermon on the Mount. And his words turn the values of this world totally upside down. We would say the peacemakers are the ones who get caught in the crossfire. But Jesus says the peacemakers are the ones who are the children of God. We would say the meek are the ones who get left on the sidelines. The go-getters inherit the world. But Jesus says the meek will inherit the earth. How does he know that? Well, he's been reading the Psalms, of course. That's where he gets these ideas, and he's taken them to heart. And so Matthew has placed this uh, marker when Jesus had finished these words uh, at the end of that block of teaching. And this morning, we come to think about Jesus as the human one. And I want to draw your attention to uh, three ideas that are packed into chapter 10. So that when he gets to 11.1, 1, he says these words that he's been talking about. What is he talking about? Well, I'm suggesting to you that there are three headings we can use to help us understand chapter 10. And the first heading is uh, the idea of a kingdom mission, an authorization of a kingdom mission. And then the idea of authorized builders. And then finally, the human one, three ideas that draw together a number of strands in this chapter. 
So let's think, first of all, about the kingdom mission. Now, the Gentiles appear in Matthew's Gospel from the very beginning. Back at Christmas, if you can remember that far back, the Christmas carols and the Christmas cards and the Bible readings, we have the Gentiles in the birth story in Matthew's Gospel. Not, in the, not, the, not the Lucan story. Matthew is interested in the Gentiles and they, they appear there in the, the Magi who come from the east. And the Gentiles are going to take an enormous amount of space at the end of Matthew's Gospel. You might remember the Great Commission where in the last words of Jesus to, recorded in Matthew's Gospel are to go into all the world and make disciples of all nations, teaching them all the things I have commanded you. These are the things that we're looking at briefly as we surge through these, these wayside markers. So they're there in the birth, the birth story and they're there at the end, the Gentiles. But for now, in the chapter that Suzanne has read to us, the beginning of the chapter as Suzanne has read, we discover they are to go in verse 6 to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. This is because the Israelites in particular knew the backstory. They had Moses and the prophets. They celebrated Passover. Their songs and prayers were in Israel's scriptures and they were sung rhythmically and regularly. The message that God should reign among them was not new or surprising. It was the longing of the prophets that God would reign, that God would take control of the topsy-turvy chaotic world in which they lived. I'm sure you've felt that as you've read the Old Testament. What a topsy-turvy chaotic world it was. Perhaps a bit like the world today, really. Wouldn't it be good if God could be seen to be in control. That's what they were looking for. There were other voices in Galilee especially who urged violence and insurrection. In the cause of Israel's God, there were zealots who urged the overthrow of the Romans. Or there were people who would pay to get inside information and help. Just as we heard Suzanne read that uh, Judas was one of the twelve who betrayed him. There was money in it if you wanted that way of proceeding. So the house of Herod or down by the Dead Sea there were the Essenes who had abandoned the uh, corrupt ritual of the temple which Jesus said had been turned into uh, a marketplace. So the mission of the twelve is to bring in the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. The kingdom of heaven is Matthew's circumlocution for the kingdom of God. Tom Wright says the twelve are to be healers, restorers, people who will bring life and hope to others and not grand status to themselves. Jesus identifies the twelve and we heard their names mentioned. And we notice that to ensure this, the details of their approach is to be very specific. What, what is that? No cash, no money bag. Accept hospitality where you're welcomed. If you're not, move on. They're not to be under any illusions. Being a friend of Jesus isn't going to get big note them with anybody. Like the prophets, they're dealing with a harsh reality and deep divisions awake them. I send you out like sheep among wolves, he said. They are to embody the values of the kingdom of which he has been speaking. And change is hard to take. It still is hard to take. We don't we don't take kindly to the idea of change if we think we're on the right track. But this was a message that was saying we need to totally rethink. We need to turn our world upside down if we want to understand the reign of God. They're not to expect better treatment than Jesus. Verse 24, 25 make that clear. They will be maligned and hauled before synagogue leaders and before governors. Jesus anticipated hostility and difficulty ahead. The twelve will encounter hostile opposition. Yet to ignore their urgent message of the kingdom will result in judgment. This is brought out vividly to the reader's attention when Matthew records Jesus' lament over the city that rejected him and his message. It's in chapter 23. This idea of judgment is revisited there. Israel was to reject his message. And he lamented that as he went to the city and wept over it. O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often when I have gathered you as a, a chicken, a hen gathers its chickens under its wings, but, but you would not. The image of God is a great mother hen embracing 
all her children, all her chickens. Uh, so we're used to a tolerant and laissez-faire society, and even today in this world, loyalty to Jesus engenders hostility and even violence. We pray week by week for one of the top 50 countries where opposition to G Jesus' teaching is still real. This week, India is going to be mentioned. But there had been terrific uh, hostility to Christians in Nigeria, notionally a Christian country. But the north of the country has seen uh, terrible killings by Boko Haram, uh, an Islamist organization. And, uh, and we know that uh, in different other places, totalitarian regimes oppress not only Christians, of course, but minorities of all kinds. So the message of Jesus calls for decision and a realignment of our priorities. Where do we go from here? Well, Jesus takes us to these disciples, the authorized builders. The number 12 is significant. Israel in the Old Testament was known as Jacob. He was renamed Israel and he had 12 sons. And they became the foundation of Israel's 12 tribes, the whole nation. So we're with the authorized builders. And by selecting a core group of 12, Jesus is laying the foundation for a restored Israel. Crowds had followed him. But so far, Matthew has only named five disciples. He's named Peter and Andrew, James and John. And then in chapter 9, he mentions his own calling from the tax booth to follow Jesus. But we told us at the beginning, of, at the, just before the Sermon on the Mount, that the crowds had followed them. And there were many on the hillside where he taught the, uh, from the, the Sermon on the Mount. And a core group of 12 is now named. And they're called Apostles. You've heard of the 12 apostles. Who are they? Well, there's Simon, who is called Peter, and his brother Andrew, and James, and son of Zebedee, and his brother John. There's Philip and Bartholomew, and Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, and Simon, the zealot, and as I said before, Judas, who betrayed him. They're known, and they're named, and they are now given authority to extend the same ministry to a wider community. It must have been pretty daunting. Suddenly, instead of following Jesus, they're invited into the driver's seat. We were talking yesterday to a, a granddaughter who's itching to get her hours up uh, in driving. It's a, quite a challenge, but you have to do it. And there's a sort of a process for becoming an authorized driver. Well, here we have authorization of people being sent out. And suddenly they have to heal the sick, preach the good news, raise the, the dead, and uh, to proclaim the kingdom of God to a widening population. Now, this is daunting indeed, but he says they're not alone. They're named and they're known. And God, who has his eye on the sparrow, has his eye on them comes out later in chapter 10. We didn't take time to read the whole chapter. But you should dip into it and read it for yourself. And you'll see that reassurance coming through there. Their journeying is totally known to God. They're reassured that the, the very hairs of their head are numbered in chapter 10 verse 30. They are known by their heavenly father. And they're of more importance than many sparrows. Courage will be needed. But fear not, says Jesus. In fact... He says it three times in chapter 10, verse 26, 28, and 31. Do not be afraid. What did he know that they didn't know? Well, he knew he was on the road to Jerusalem. He knew what awaited him there. He had read the prophets. He knew Isaiah 53 and many other passages from Zechariah and from other passages, Psalm 22. They were in his mind and they shaped his approach. The disciples feed on Jesus. These are the ones who eat the bread and drink the wine that represents his dying love later on as the story unfolds. Their union with Christ is a union of trust and it's intimate. And they're so identified with him that he says a cup of cold water given to him, given to a disciple, will be as if it were given to Jesus himself. When I was reading uh, Tom Holland's book, um, Dominion, I read a little bit about Martin of Tours. 
and uh, I didn't know the story, but Martin of Tours, one very cold night, was, was, was on his way uh, traveling and he came across a man who had no cloak and Martin tore his cloak in half and gave half to the cold man and went on with his own half garment. And that night he had a dream and in his dream Jesus came to him and thanked him for loaning him his garment. And so Martin built a, t uh, a chapel there and th there's a great shrine there in France to Martin of Tours to this day. Uh, it's seen comings and goings but uh, Tom Holland mentions this incident and it's as if he knew that it wouldn't only be a cup of cold water that would be given in, in Jesus' name, but it would be many other things, as we heard of Tim Tebow wanting to be someone who gives into the, into the world for the welfare of others, and especially the vulnerable, especially children. So the twelve are called apostles. And the word uh, apostle comes from the Greek word apostello, which means to send. These are the authorized people who are sent. It's a core group, and it's intentionally foundational. They've been traveling with Jesus, marveling at his teaching and healing. They're a unique band. Uh, Luke makes that point in Luke 6. Acts chapter 1, verse 2 mentions it. Ephesians 2, 20 mentions it. Here Matthew tells us that they are commissioned and sent out in the first 15 verses of chapter 10. The names of the 12 are written the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible, tells us in his big picture that it builds uh, that on the foundation of what God has built, the holy city, are the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. In time, others are commissioned and also sent and they will have the term apostle applied to them. We notice in Acts chapter 1 where the disciples said, well, we've only got 11 now. Judas has left us. And they made a, a cast ballots and they, Matthias was chosen to take Judas's place. So he also became an apostle. The two criteria for apostleship there were he had to have been one of the ones who'd been with Jesus the whole time and he had to uh, be selected by the Holy Spirit. And so there was Ma Matthias was chosen. But in Romans chapter 1 Paul tells us that he also was an apostle. He was authorized. And in uh, chapter 16 of Romans, uh, Paul tells us that Andronicus and Junius are among the apostles. So we have a woman mentioned there. And I think Luke would be telling us uh, that Mary, sent by the risen Lord to the apostles themselves, was actually commissioned and sent to share the good news of the resurrection. She was the first with that message. Perhaps Mary should also be numbered among the apostles. I certainly think so. So we have a mission and we have the kingdom builders, the authorized builders. But now we come to the last thing I want to share from this chapter. And, and I've used the expression, the human one. What does Jesus mean when he says, truly I tell you, I will not finish going through the... You will not finish going through the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. That's an expression from verse 23. Before the Son of Man comes. Well, Jesus' favorite way of referring to himself is as the Son of Man. Now, this is an ambiguous term. It means mortal or human one. And it's used as a human being throughout the book of Ezekiel. However, it's often linked to a character in the book of Daniel, chapter 7, where a strange figure, one like unto a son of man, moves from earth into the presence of the Ancient of Days. He's brought before the Ancient of Days, and he is given authority, honor, and royal power so that all the people of all nations and languages and races would serve him. His authority would be forever. And his kingdom would never end. In Jesus' time, this cryptic self-designation, Son of Man, which Jesus uses again and again, was understood as a messianic promise. 
the strange event to which Jesus refers, the coming of the Son of Man, will happen before the disciples' mission is completed, according to 10.23. How are we to understand this? Well, there are various views. Googling the meaning of the passage will quickly reveal half a dozen different views. I incline to one taught by Professor Tom Wright. He notes that the coming of the Son of Man in Daniel is a coming from earth into God's presence. If this is conceded, then it seems most likely that Jesus is alluding to his ascension to the Father. As Wright says, the Jesus who has gone now into God's dimension until the time when the veil is lifted from God's multidimensional reality is brought in all its glory is the human Jesus. He bears human flesh and the marks of the man-made nails and spears to this day as he lives within God's dimension, not far away, but as near to us as breath itself. So it seems Jesus had quite an amazing vision here, that he was traveling to his destiny as the Savior, but he was going to be rejected, as he'd said again and again. He was going to suffer and die, and on the third day rise. And he was going to be the one who would enter into God's reality and be there, a scarred image of a man, to bring in an eternal kingdom. It made me think of uh, something I heard more than 50 years ago of a renowned Scottish preacher of old known as Rabbi Duncan. He exclaimed memorably that the dust of the earth is on the throne of the universe. Nearer than breath itself, he will, in the good timing of the Father, be fully revealed, now with scars. The blueprint of God's renewed humanity is the one truly human one and our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. May God bless his word to us. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for the sweeping vision of a redeemed and restored humanity pursued by the Son of Man, our Savior. Thank you that he willingly paid the cost of our salvation and has shared the invitation to join him in demonstrating the kingdom of heaven day by day. Please forgive those times when we have turned aside from the path he has opened for us. Help us each day by day by your Holy Spirit to build on the foundation of the Lord Jesus as he's been shared with us by his apostles and prophets, by evangelists, pastors and teachers, through whom you have spoken. Thank you that as our coronavirus restrictions are easing, the majority of people seem keen to secure their own health and that of the wider community. We pray that in places where the spread of the virus is not contained, all frontline workers will be given the necessary safety equipment and protection. We remember COVID-19 remains real and we have as yet no vaccine nor cure. Please grant cooperation among and inspiration to the medical researchers pursuing treatment and a vaccine. Speak calm and reassurance to families feeling frustration, sadness, and anger because of income and job losses. Please comfort those who have lost loved ones. May we play our part in bringing support to the needy. We ask that across the world, from Hong Kong to the USA, and here in Australia, justice will prevail in the treatment of all citizens. Help us bring peace to the war zones of the world. Help weapons manufacturers to discover it is the peacemakers who will be called your children. Enable the wealthy nations to invest in medical research and agricultural equipment. Overthrow tyranny everywhere, we pray. Heavenly Father, please protect Christians in Nigeria and northern Kenya 
from the systemic attacks of Boko Haram and Al-Shabaab. We also ask for the safety of Christians and those of other minority religions in all the nations which deny or restrict religious freedom. This week we think especially of India, China and South Saudi Arabia. Turn the hearts of enemies into friends. Grant freedom to Leah Sharibu and Ken Elliott, we ask. Enable us to live this week as those who have discovered the truly human one in the person of the Lord Jesus. Enrich our humanity as we follow him. Unite us as Lord. Unite us, Lord, as we pray together the words you have taught us, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. The closing period of reflection by Bach and played by Amanda. Thank you, Amanda. We're grateful to Ian and Sonia for ensuring that Amanda's playing was recorded for us this morning. I thought it a bit mischievous of Ian to pan around to show us the phantom. I, I'm assuming it's uh, a reminder to the family of their son, Monty, who's on the front line in, uh, as an ambo in, in London perhaps one of Monty's comics, or maybe something that Ian's kept for old time's sake, certainly brings back memories of days gone by. So thank you, Ian and Sonia, and uh, God bless you. Let us close with the benediction. Heavenly Father, as we seek this week in front of us to walk in the steps of Jesus, guide us, we pray, by your Spirit. Might your words speak to us. Help us to hear with fresh ears the words of Jesus across the years that we might play our part in making the world ever more like the kingdom that we are pursuing. So may your reign be seen in us and may grace and mercy and peace from Father, Son and Holy Spirit rest upon and remain with each one today and always. Amen. God bless you.